I'm delighted to welcome today Alan Kennedy from Apollo Business Broking. And Alan is a really unusual character because he's one of the uh, rare breeds of accountants who can actually sell. Uh, normally the two don't go hand in hand. And Alan has previous experience of running many businesses, um, strong sales background, also tax expert, uh, regulation expert, teaches you how to speak, regulation speak, uh, if you've got any um, regulation things and also pricing as well. So not quite sure where we're going to go with the conversation, Alan. I'll leave uh, you to introduce yourself, but a background on how you came to do what you're doing and maybe touch on previous businesses. Yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, thanks, Elaine. I, I'm not sure I've ever been described as a rare breed before, but <laughs> it's flattering. Um, yes, uh, just by way of background, I, I'm now 66, so I'm winding down a bit. Um, and I run a small business brokerage with my friend Dominic Marlowe. Uh, between us, we've sort of bought and sold over 220 businesses. And we do that by having what we call win-win negotiations, because the world of business broking is absolutely full of sharks. And it's important to us, our typical client turns over between one and five million. And what they'll do is they'll sell their business, say, for a half million pounds. Uh, to, and the person who buys it is fully aware that that asset could disappear tomorrow. Think Enron, think Arthur Anderson. Uh, businesses are very fragile things if you don't manage them carefully. Conversely, the person who's selling it is also aware that he's going to give typically, say, £250,000 of credit to someone he's never met, doesn't know. And that person could either disappear tomorrow or find a way of not paying him if he could. And so not only do you need good lawyers, but you also need to build a considerable deal of trust. Um, and uh, so we so we set about our business broking by building that trust process. Our average sales cycle is about eight months. It's not like someone rings up and buys a business, not like buying uh, a sort of sweeties over the counter. It's, it's a very long, courtship almost and we love it we love it to bits we get good results we sell about 75 to 80 percent of all businesses we take on for sale we sell um and it is great fun to help people retire gracefully for what a better description anyway i hope that answers your your background on on uh, your question on background and what i've done oh, i suppose i didn't say what i've done i built two accountancy practices i added i took a financial services business from three to nine million turnover in a four-year period and I added a shed load of income onto an accountancy training business. Um, done a lot of consultancy with accountants uh, uh, as well, particularly on pricing and that sort of thing. So anyway, apologies for talking too much. Um, I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. You never apologise for talking too much on the podcast. That's what we're here for. Okay, um, lovely. Inspire the listeners. And the only way we can do that is by talking and ask, asking questions. So um, amongst all of that, there's a lot of regulation. So regulation comes at us from every angle. It doesn't matter if we're running a school, a, a business, a law practice, accountancy firm, you know, whatever. Um, so how do you how do you manage the regulation because when you're you're buying and selling businesses every industry sector will have its own regulation so is there a kind of standard that goes across all of these business platforms or is it do you have to know about all the regulation within each of the specific areas uh there is a sort of standard yes there's quite a good document called the regulators code which is quite interesting and tell the regulators how they should act some people largely ignore it but it is there and in addition, uh, uh, I've gone through regulatory business, uh, visits in about five or six industries, so I'm quite used to the, the procedure. So if, if you were selling a business, the first thing you would do is look at the previous time of regulation and, uh, and see what the report was like and get a feel for what the relationship with the, with the regular is like, regulator is like. But also, more importantly, is for anyone buying the business, they won't want to take on a business which is likely to have a shed load of regulatory issues. And so they'll be very interested to hear the type of language that the seller will, will speak. So the way I often phrase it is regulators speak in French. And unless we learn to speak French, we don't get to play their game. So when I was running an accounting practice, we used to train our staff and say, if you didn't document it, you didn't do it. And that's a sort of French speaking phrase for that description that most normal people get on and do stuff. Regulators like stuff to be documented. And so therefore you have to decide how to regulate, how to document what you're doing. 
And if you say aggressively, well, I'm not doing that, that's a complete waste of my time, you know you've got a regulatory issue, potentially. And the same is true with tax legislation. Most good businesses, most of the good business I come across, compliance is just like a prerequisite. It's not worth having a battle with your regulator. What you want at all with the tax authorities, it's not a good way of making money by saving the odd 50p here or there on getting away with stuff. The best way of making money is by making money, by going out and building a decent business with a good product. And so, so that will be coming into the, the whole environment is that no one wants to buy a business which is going to hit a lot of regulatory problems and where the staff hadn't been trained in my bonds to speak French properly. So, yeah. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's really important about speaking the right language, isn't it? Because yeah. every industry sector has got buzzwords and acronyms and, and so on. And yeah. uh, if you're if you're new to the industry sector, it takes a while to to you know pick up on what these with these acronyms and uh, so on are. And yeah. um, we were talking before um, we we started recording about the sad case of a, a head teacher who um, took her own life because of the lack of um, documentary evidence of the wonderful work they were doing in the school, but they weren't um, documented. So that really, really is so important, isn't it? Yeah, that was the case of Ruth Perry. I mean, very sad case. He committed suicide. What had happened was her school was rated good on three areas and then failed their self building assessment. And because of that, it, the management was then rated uh, um, inadequate, would you believe, even though it was a well-run school. And on top of that, the, um, uh, the whole school was then rated inadequate, even though it was a well-run school. And there was a complete contradiction between this finding on safeguarding and what the children were actually saying, saying things like, we feel safe, we enjoy being here, that sort of thing. And if it had been an inadequately safeguarded organisation, then they would have had a shed load of complaints, etc. So, so it was a non-sequitur reading. I mean, clearly we don't know all the facts of the situation, but that's probably why the regulated find it so difficult is because it didn't make logical sense. And and uh, when I was training tax trainees at KPMG, I used to say, show me the words of logical sense in the tax legislation. Mm -hmm. Okay, And sometimes you just have to suck it up and say, it doesn't make logical sense, but that's life. And, and in terms of if you're an owner of a business and protecting your mental health, and I know you do a lot of work with people protecting their mental health, to learn to be that tough, you have to train the way that your mind thinks um, uh, a bit like cognitive psychology. And a good entrepreneur will have trained their way their mind thinks so that things like regulators don't affect their mental health. And conversely, you can train the way your mind thinks it, uh, uh, when you start off a business to help mean that things like rejection doesn't affect your mental health because being a business is mentally very tough uh, you know being an employee is mentally quite tough on occasions as well but being being the entrepreneur can be mentally very tough and uh, um, and so a lot of that is training in mind and to think the right sort of ways to protect yourself you know? mm. very very important and, and leads in yeah. you know with the work that i do with behavioral profiling and how that that our mental and physical uh, yeah. well-being relates to our health and well-being our career success you know the whole lot's inextricably linked and it yeah. reminds me of um with the i was looking at in fact i wrote an article recently lawyers are 22 percent more likely to consider suicide than other professions uh, which is interesting and, and i suspect a lot of that is to do with the regulation and you know and the pressures of work the um potential bullying um, from partners to team members. I mean, there's a whole, whole raft of things there. Uh, yeah, it's it, from that perspective, it is potentially a, a toxic industry, particularly as they're charging such high prices, you know, if you think of a large London law firm, because the clients will expect perfect service for that level of cost. And uh, the, the partners will expect their staff to give perfection in terms of the way they perform. And it produces a culture which is entirely actually inappropriate to produce imperfection. Perfection is much more likely to happen if people love their work and don't feel pressurized. Um, uh, it might be less profitable, but it's but it's a much better, it's much better to have positively motivated staff than negatively motivated staff in terms of the well-being of your staff. So uh, so one of the things we, we do when we're talking to business owners about selling is getting their staff to a point where they are positively rather than negatively motivated and they enjoy the work and they're looking for opportunity because that 
makes for a much better business to sell than one where the staff really hate working there because when it's sold, they'll find any excuse to leave, basically. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Do you yeah. find also, um, in, in my experience, I, I find that the leadership of the business have a different profile, a different um, a different personality type, shall we say, to the people in the team, and often that causes confusion and oh, confliction. Ab absolutely, some of the people that I'm involved with don't understand how their staff thinks. I mean, and it's probably best shown by the job efforts. Uh, uh, I've done quite a lot of mentoring of accountants, and the typical accountant's job effort basically lists the tasks that they want to be done. Okay. And, and I say to them, I'm going to paraphrase your job advert. Mm -hmm. uh, and it says, please, could you come and work for me really hard so I get rich and you remain poor? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, so you've got that problem is that the entrepreneur is sometimes very focused, which is a different personality from an employee. But also to be a good on entrepreneur in terms of this personality profiling, you probably need to be strong on DNI. Okay. Mm -hmm. Whereas to be a good staff member and sometimes a good process manager, they tend to be stronger on S and C. So I think again, the big county profession, a lot of the staff doing the work were very strong on S and C. And when I was a partner, medium-sized firm accountants, the staff would have found me really difficult because I used to think differently from them. And conversely, I found them really difficult as well. And it wasn't until I learned to speak their language and made their life comfortable steady and compliant that actually we started to get on better together so whereas previously it was a very difficult fractious relationship um and that is the key is to understand how people think of what they want in order to help them do their job better and help them not be stressed and whatever and then they'll respect you for it because if you care people people love people who care basically so and that caring comes across uh, you know if if you're just in it for me you'll have a relationship with your staff, which reflect the fact that you're just in it for you. Okay, so... Uh, yeah. so uh, yeah. Absolutely. And then collectively, um, all of the aspects of the disbehavioural profiling module are there. The leader has the DNI, and &I, I &D, the yeah. people in the team have the S&C, CNS, whichever way they're led. So collectively, yeah. you've got everything that's needed, introversion, extroversion, attention to detail. I thought you were going to say, um, when you were talking about the, the advert, I, I help um, uh, accountancy and law firms with recruitment. I'm not a recruiter, but a particular part of the, the process where we're looking at the behavioural characteristics of the role and of the uh, candidates, the shortlisted candidates. And quite yeah. often what they're, what they're seeking is must have attention to detail and be outgoing. Well, <laughs> usually that, yes. doesn't, that does not work, you know. It, yeah. And the number of accountants that I've profiled, the number of accountancy practices I've profiled the team, where the yeah. leaders are, are the Ds and Is, or D and C, which is even more difficult to get on with for the for yes. other people. Um, and then the, the, the team are, are, are the, the introverts. So um, I, I, I did a piece of work recently where I was asked to look at the promotional um, suitability from one, one grade to another grade. And yeah. I said that I would not have hired any of these people as an accountant. They're not accountant type people. However, for leadership, they'll be fine with it, with a few caveats that I was able to guide on. So there's no end of information that you can use from this, this type of approach. Uh, absolutely. Throughout industry, the, is it a Peter principle where you're promoted to your level yes. of incompetence supplies? Incompetence. Um, yeah. and, uh, and different jobs need different personality types. And so therefore... Just because if you do well in one job doesn't mean that you will do well in the next level if it needs a different personality type. And uh, and, uh, uh, and so that's the key. Um, what are we going to talk about pricing a bit? Because that's... Yeah, we're going to go to pricing. So yeah. um, that's my next question. You, you you mentioned pricing in your in your introduction. So what um, what do people need to look out for in pricing? Because uh, there's so many different ways of, of, of skinning this cat. Absolutely. Probably best indicated, shown by every time I meet an accountant, I will always ask him, how much do you charge for a simple set of accounts that turns over two fifty thousand pounds company that you have to file a company's house and do a personal tax and corporation tax return? 
I've had probably over about 600 accountants answer that question. And in all cases, uh, the answers vary from 350 pounds up to 5,000. Now, for what is ostensibly, ostensibly the same product. And when you ask clients, how much do they expect to pay for a set of accounts in the 250,000 pound turnover, et cetera, the prices vary from 350 pounds up to 5,000 pounds. It's just amazing the variation of expectations that you get. Actually, probably 4,000 is the highest I've ever had. Generally, clients tend to have a lower expectation than the accountants have. It probably says something. And that got me thinking when I was asking that question, why is that? And it's all to do with client perception. And pricing is often not about your product. It's about what the client wants. So uh, we do lots of seminars on pricing to help people charge higher prices. Because from my experience, there's a lot of professionals. Uh, I would exclude from that the large London firms, whether that's accounts or lawyers, but a lot of professionals undercharge for their services. And that's largely due to a confidence issue. So we talked about personality. So we talked about a lot about confidence. And we, we help people with pricing by saying, what's your conversion rate? How many of those people who come to you um, actually sign up? And most professionals proudly say, 70 or 80 percent something like that whereas actually that's a pretty good indication they're pricing too low because if they're getting no price resistance then the probably the pricing is too cheap for the quality of what they provided because we've already established the quality by virtue of the fact that 70 or 80 percent are signing up so you know if they were rubbish professionals and hadn't come with good recommendations then that wouldn't happen so uh, and and then uh, probably best illustrated by Another question I often ask people is how much do you expect to pay for a personal trainer? So what would you pay for your personal trainer? Give me a figure. I've no idea. Um, right. 100 a month? I've, I've no idea. Right. Well, prices, again, vary from probably £25 a week to, to £150 a month, something like that. So, But um, uh, I came across a personal trainer who was charging five clients £40,000 a year. £40,000 a year for a personal trainer, good grief. I know. But what he'd done, and it was very clever, is he was a specialist in getting high-profile executives back to work if they'd had a health scare. And, and so let's imagine this scenario that you're on income of about £400,000 a year and you have a heart attack and you're thinking, one, I'm very valuable to that business, so I don't want to be off work for any longer than I need to be, and two, my colleagues might think, oh, if he's not there anymore, we could save 400,000 pounds. So you want to get back to work as quickly as you possibly can so you don't have a problem. So there's a desperate desire to get back to work. And this personal trainer is perceived as the world's best at getting people back to work quickly. So they don't care what it costs. They just want to get back to work quickly. And the key there is that he's perceived by his customer base as a specialist. And people will say things like, well, because you're a specialist, I expect to pay you more money. But I can show you other specialists who don't charge more money because they haven't got the confidence to do so. Mm. And, and so it's the client perception is, is the key. And so when we're sell, buying and selling businesses, people say, how much will I get for my business? And I, can, I will always say, well, we can't answer that because we don't know what some, how much someone is desperate to buy your business. We can answer the question, how much do other businesses like yours, how much have they been sold for in the past? but we might get the one person who is desperate to buy your business for whatever reason. And that is the key to buying and selling businesses is to find a, a level of desperation within the client and to, and to see it from a perspective. So like, for example, I bought my house a few months ago and it's just around the corner from my grandkids, which is what I wanted. So to me, it's a very valuable house because that means I don't have to drive half an hour every day to see them and that sort of thing. But to everyone else, it's just a house. And I paid a price for it that was just a house price. And I would have paid probably be 40,000 pounds more for this house. Why? Because it was very valuable to me. So the key in selling is finding people where the product is very valuable. And there will be people out there who perceive that value and want it, really. And that's that's a, a lot of that is to do with confidence. So to, when you when you mention the price, so the price for, you, for being your personal trainer is 40,000 pounds, and then shutting up and saying nothing, mm. okay? And that, that is really key. So so you, you've outlined how you can help this person get back to work quickly. And I 
talk about it, helping people get from Hell Island to Heaven. That's our job as professionals, really. We help people get from Hell Island to Heaven Island. And, uh, and so in my business, it's helping people get in from having no buyers who are, you know, want too much credit through to having a good buyer who doesn't want to take too much credit and is not prepared to offer a good price. Um, uh, and so once you've agreed that you can help people get from A to B, you then need to discuss with them, well, what are their alternatives? And if they have no other alternatives, immediately the price goes up. And if they do have alternatives, then the price will be reflected by what they perceive as the other alternatives are. So the more you're a specialist, the more you charge. And uh, uh, and so we would often, and then we go on to price. And and when we, so we've already agreed. So a classic question would be, so Elaine, I'm going to help you sell your business. On a scale of one to 10, how likely do you, um, do you think I am to get the best deal for you? And it, if you answer, anything below nine, I'll say, why do you think that? Mm. Okay, and we will keep on talking until you get to a nine or 10. If you answer nine or 10, you're likely to get the best price for me, then, or the best deal for me, then I'll say, okay, let's talk about price. And then I'll come in with a price and then I will shut up. Do you know what the record is for the longest silence between the entrepreneur and the professional services provider? I would imagine it's quite short. I don't know. 22 minutes of silence. No, really? Absolutely. And what happened was it was a deal which basically he had a particular skill at helping sales teams perform and they tried everything they could to try and get this business from nine to 10 million turnover. And he, he said, well, I think I can get it up by a million pounds. And I, I think, I, I don't know the entire story. It was a, it was a, um, told to me by a, a, a person who coaches me, and he charged ten percent of the increase in turnover. So let's. Uh, that's. I think they were aiming for ten million pounds of increase in turnover, and he said it moved million pounds. And the chief exec shut up and said nothing for twenty-two minutes. He, he said what he was doing was he thought, "Am I going to sell this to the board? Can I afford that? What will the cash flow be like?" How do I feel about that? I could employ people full time to do this, and all of that will go through his brain before he looks up and he says, yes, how do we do this? Okay. Or he'll look up and say, that's very expensive. Okay. And, and so what you do in those circumstances, you always throw it back to the person and say, how do you mean very expensive? And what they mean is that they've got to make down the pub who we'll do it for 950,000 or a million. And, and I say, well, yes, well, let's, we've already discussed, am I the best? You've already given me a nine out of 10. For the best person to get an extra 10 million pounds worth of turnover so therefore we already know i'm better than the guy down at the pub how much extra turnover will he get you will he get you the extra 10 million of turnover well no he won't so we're not comparing like that okay and so pricing is key both to the self-esteem of a businessman because when you get a good price you feel really good about yourself because it says your client values you and also it reduces the stress a lot because it allows you to employ good staff and because you can employ good staff, you can give good service, and because you can give good service, et cetera. And so that's why we will often start on pricing. And sometimes we get involved in selling businesses where we say to the entrepreneur, no, don't sell yet for two reasons. One, you can carry on for another three years and make as much money as you'll get on the sale price or four or five years. And two, we could actually help you increase your prices by 20%, which makes you a lot more valuable to business to sell. And so we would always have that discussion before someone sells their business, is now the top right time for you to sell? Doesn't matter about the buyer, what about the individual? And very often it's not the right time. People are just tired. And actually what you need to do is deal with the tiredness, not deal with the, the desire to sell, if that makes sense. Because mm, of course, when we're tired, we don't make, um, we, we don't think clearly, we don't make good business decisions. And Absolutely we're not. so stressed yeah. out, we just want, we just want out. So. Um, yes. So you mentioned pricing as one way for people to to look at to, to you know to get ready. Should we say what what other things do people need to look at if they're thinking about selling their business? Uh, well, they need to sort out their compliance, their tax compliance, their employee compliance, all of that sort of stuff. Um, uh, that's a that's a prerequisite, you know, because it, I saw one the other day where someone had done something dodgy with their director's remuneration. The sale price was say a million quid. 
and the potential contingent liability of a revenue worker that point. We don't have enough staff to sometimes ask the right questions. But I could see just looking at you had a four hundred thousand pound potential contingent liability. So um, uh, you just don't need that sort of headache. But much more of an important issue is working out who will fit well with their business, mm -hmm. and you have to get in my, inside the mind of the, the the buyer. And one of the key people was quite interesting. If you look at good businessmen, I remember I went to my school reunion about fifteen years ago. It was we when we were all aged. 50 and we had our 30 year reunion and one of the very bright individuals he said to me alan do you do you think's done best in business since we left school 30 years ago and we looked around the room and there was one person there who outshone everyone else he was on an income of about half a million pounds a year being a senior executive in a very large insurance company and so we said him yet when he was at school he wasn't in the top set and he wasn't even in the top of the middle set. He was halfway down the middle set. But what this individual had is an enormous amount of emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. He knew how people ticked. And to build a business, you don't need to be bright. You need to understand people. So you need to understand the staff. For example, what makes a person who comes to work for you tick? Because if you can do that, you get happy employees. And you need to understand when you're selling a business, you need to understand the buyer and what will make them tick. Now, for different buyers, that will be different things. Mm -hmm. So typically, the businesses we sell will be sold to someone who's bigger than them, who wants to buy in turnover, for want a better description, because they can run the whole thing more efficiently and more cheaply if they buy in the turnover. So, uh, and so you have to understand that's what you're selling. So when you, when you prepare your business for sale, you have to say, how risky is this block of turnover I'm selling going to be? So if you've only got two customers, it's off the scale in terms of risk. And you're only getting paid on an earn out because they'll say, well, if it disappears, I'm not interested. If if you've got no one customer having more than 5% of your turnover, then you've got a very sellable asset. If you've got renewable contacts, that's really good. If you've got clients who are where it's difficult for them to get out of the relationship, then that again is really good. And that makes you a very valuable asset. If you've got clients who are very unlikely to leave the relationship, providing you don't mess up, Again, that makes for a very valuable asset. I saw once a burglar on business sold where they just had a whole load of repeat business and they got an extremely good price because the purchaser knew that they could run that business without any increase in overheads. In fact, the whole thing would become much more efficient. And basically, they got a multiple three times gross profit and the business that was being sold was making no money at all. So you had an asset that was making nothing sold for in today's terms about a million pounds even though it was worthless in terms of return on capital or multiples of EBITDA, et cetera. So EBITDA is a multiple profit, basically, for those who don't understand. Um, so, so getting inside the head of the buyer and then writing all the sales documentation that answers the buyer's questions is key. So you have to have in mind the sort of person who might want to buy, whereas if the person who wanted to buy had been a venture capitalist who's rewarded on getting returns of capital above 25%, Selling that burger on business would have been a complete waste of time because he would look at the EBITDA and think, well, the return is nothing. Why are you wasting my time? You know, that's what he would think. And so it's, whereas conversely, and what you're really looking for in a business sale is synergy. So I saw one which was particularly brilliant once. Number one, the PLC that was buying the business had a very low return on capital in uh, the um, uh, in the, on the stock market, so earnings per share was something like three or four or five percent. So they were quite happy with a ten percent return on capital, or even a twenty percent return on capital. Why? And that's what they pay. They pay twenty times the EBITDA because they knew they could take this business and upsell. So it was an insurance company, and what they did was introduce all their sales staff into the particular business they were buying. And it took off like that. And they made an awful lot of money very quickly out of the upset, for want of a better description. And they knew that when they were buying the business. And the person selling it knew it. And they got an amazing price for it. It was a proper win-win negotiation. So uh, <laughs> it was quite interesting, actually. We were, I was working with KPMG at the time, and we were all sworn to secrecy. And next door was my, was 
my neighbor was a solicitor for this large PLC. She was the internal in-house solicitor. And we had to be extremely careful that we didn't mention this thing. And when the deal had all been done, we could all relax a bit. We were chatting over the garden, what would actually do? And she said, oh, I had to be so careful. I didn't mention it to you. And you probably had to be the same. I said, yes, I did. Okay, it was all code words and all that sort of thing. And I said, just about two days before we signed on the dotted line, I was sitting on a bus. And one of the secretaries said to someone else completely out loud, have you heard we're buying? And then mentioned the name of the company. Okay. <laughs> so it was just like, but just epic breach of confidentiality. But, uh, but that's life sometimes. Anyway, but it was only on the bus coming back from, uh, from, from the workplace. So it probably was filled with that particular PLC staff anyway. So yeah, so uh, that was just an interesting situation. But, but no, going back to your question, you have to get inside the mind of the buyer. And if you do that, you write your sales documentation, which answers their questions, and you have an idea who's going to get synergy out of this business sale. Okay. Does that, does that answer the question? Yes. Yeah. You, you mentioned three times gross profit as a, as a, um, a value that's, that's been paid or price that's been paid. Is that, is that typical or is it? Is it no, no 80%, 80 of all deals are based on what's called the adapted EV card. So you take the profits in the accounts, you would add back the director's remuneration. So he may be drawing no remuneration or minimum remuneration, or he may be joining at £250,000 a year. We don't know. And then you put in there the cost of a manager you would have to have to run the business. So, so, uh, so say on this particular deal I'm thinking of, the owner manager was putting a lot of effort into running the business. So the PLC that brought it out, would have needed not one but probably two staff to replace the other manager who was working 80 hours a week and knew the business like the back of his hand so they would have had a, an adjustment downwards of 80,000 pounds for staff so that gives you an, what's called an adjusted EBITDA figure and you would put in there other stuff like so if they didn't rent their premises then but owned them and weren't paying any rent that would affect the EBITDA calculation because the new company might have to buy premises Etc. and pay extra interest, uh, pay uh, rent on it or whatever, and and so you got unusual or exceptional items. So they had a big bad debt right off that window, and then you would have a multiple of that. And generally within industries, they have fairly established multiples. So engineering would be less than, say, um, accountancy for one of a description. So yeah, so um, because engineering is very cyclical and goes up and down like that whereas accounting is, tends to be quite stable. So, yeah, so so that's usually it's EBITDA, but just occasionally industries have other methods of valuing it. So um, uh, the accounting profession uses a multiple gross current fees, almost regard up to a certain level. So above half a million quid, maybe not, but below half a million pounds, almost certainly it does. Um, and uh, even though if a business is making no money, because a new company can make money out of the recurring fees, even if a business is undercharging, it just happens, and that's the way it's valued. Generally speaking, is uh, is they do as a multiple recurring fees, and any the uplisting value then is a trip goes to the new purchaser, and um, any downfall in value, the new purchaser suffers. So, so you need to quite a lot of protection about clients leaving and that sort of thing in those sort of deals. Others are placed on multiple gross profits where they can be absorbed without any increase in overheads. So the work on business being a case in point, because once you've got your database in your vans, you can service not any number of businesses, but you, the whole process becomes more efficient than if you've only got three clients in an area where it takes you half an hour to drive to each slot. One of those, which, so, so yes, so, um, um, uh, but 80% of them will be on that multiple VBITDA. Um, uh, why? Uh, well, I would argue it's not necessarily logical because I think it should be multiple of the added value to the future business. But uh, that's just what it is, really. Uh, 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 and sometimes trying to get people out of that mindset is a challenge. The added value to the, the future business, though, is only um, useful to, to, you know, if, if the... The own, like, like like you were saying about your house, um, yeah. you would have been prepared to pay more because the value yeah. to you would be greater than than anybody would would imagine. Yeah. You know? And in terms of the house sale, they needed two people whose grandkids lived five minutes from Blenheim Drive. Okay. 
and then we would have squabbled over the price and eventually the price would have gone up and settled. And the very dangerous thing is ever to be in a position where you've only got one buyer, one seller. You know, it's just like, oh, you, well, in a business sale, you only have one seller, but you never want only one buyer because you want people competing against each other. So that's the entire reverse of the situation that, that I spoke about, the, the personal trainer who charged 40,000 pounds mm-hmm. a year, where he's only got, they've only got one provider, only one person in the world is saying, I can get you back to work quickly. Okay, well, that's the perception of the client. Whereas mm-hmm. if, you're on, if you're in a reverse situation, you're sitting at, you want as many people squabbling over the price as you possibly can, so it goes up and up, and you get a, a lot of fear of missing out. You know, oh dear, it's de- you know, uh, it, we're desperate to uh, buy this thing, and that's a really, if you're a seller, that's a really good thing to do is to get people with a desperation that they don't want to miss out because then, if you go back to house prices a year ago, you get used to get prices which were forty thousand pound higher than they are now because of that single fear of missing out. People are desperate; they would be able to buy a house. So, um, okay. You mentioned earnout as part of um, the, the sort of conundrum and things that go on. Um, yeah. Can you explain what you mean about earnout? Yeah, so let's take that verbal art business, which is selling for half a million pounds. What they would say is, we'll pay you £250,000 now, okay, in order to show that we're serious about this transaction. And then we'll pay you another £125,000 in a year's time and another £125,000 in another year's time if all the promises you've made about this business are correct. Okay, so you have to itemize clearly what the promises they're actually making is. So if you say something like, my staff are loyal and stick around, they might say, well, assuming that we haven't had more than 30% downturn in staff turnover, uh, staff numbers or something like that, or more likely what they'll say is, if you say you're my customers, that's very rare to that, that sort of deal. Although they're not unheard of, it might be that, they're buying a business for the key people within the business. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, you might get um, a situation where they say, you say you've got a stable customer base and they'll say, right, okay, providing the customers hang around, we will pay you extra money. And you need to be very careful on those in the words of one corporate finance, finance broker once. You're better off assuming that if you get any money out of your earn out, it's an added bonus. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Because once you bought it and you parted company with the previous owner, they have no incentive to pay you any money whatsoever, other than the fear of a big legal bill. And so you have to have a way of making sure that they pay. And we have seen some horrendous stuff, particularly if you've got badly drafted contracts. We saw once where the um, the contract was drafted such that it was payable by the purchaser. But if a purchaser decided to stop the business, there was no money payable. So all the purchaser did was transfer the trade into new co. And he said, well, old co has got no customers. Ergo, I'm not paying you £250,000. So you need in there. So when I sold my accounting practice, there was a clause that the purchaser would do what they could to preserve the goodwill. Uh, 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 and that was key because otherwise they could have just checked the prices up and only kept two or three clients you know that's uh, uh, who uh, and so yeah so we we that was very important and you need to be very careful on that that's because the person paying the money has no real incentive so you've got to make sure they're a person of integrity for one better description that they're not the sort of person who and that's not always possible but you want to ask around and you want to do as much due diligence on the purchaser as the purchaser is doing on the acquisition target because you're trying to build up trust yeah so and, you know uh, when i was um, in business I, every client used to have a credit limit and someone said to me what well, what well, even if a queen wants her tax return and you set her a credit limit? i said yes because it might not be the queen bearing the bill it might be their principal private secretary and he may hate accountants and he may think my fee is too high so so and actually her capital gains tax is probably quite complicated and he may not understand that. So he may think it's the same as his capital gains tax, which is quite straightforward. And and so he think, he doesn't understand the fact that I would need specialist capital gains tax advisors to do the Queen's capital gains tax, or, or as the case, the King's capital gains tax. So, yeah, so it's, it's uh, so every business needs to set a credit limit. And in the case of business sale, you can just think, oh, I might not get this money unless they've got incentive to. Uh, and you need clauses in there that it makes it very painful for them 
if I don't pay the, the other form of credit description. It's, it's, it's very, very complicated. <clears throat> that is definitely yeah. clear. Um, <laughs> friends who on earn out, um, they, they were given shares, um, but of course the share price went down. Other friends who didn't get the money that, you know, and, and yes. one friend's do, doing a legal case at the moment. So there's an awful lot to it, but I think bottom line is we need an expert like you to, to guide both, both yeah. sides. I, I had a case the other day where a guy lost £12 million on his business sale. Um, uh, the person buying it, I knew, was entirely untrustworthy. He just had a reputation of being the most vicious businessman around. And I would have looked that guy in the eyeball and said, do you really trust that guy? And But you need that sort of background. You need to know. Because there is a sometimes you get people in business who've built really big businesses by really vicious, nasty, and horrible. And so if you're selling your business, you generally want to avoid those sort of people. You know, you want people to build businesses because they're, they're kind to their staff and they're kind to their customers. You know, they've got integrity for one of their description. So yeah. uh, uh, that's not always the case, but that's 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 the idea. So because life is too short isn't it, to, to deal with people who are vicious, nasty, and horrible. And we go back to our discussion about mental health you start doing business with people like that and it's not always possible to avoid them it, it has a risk of having quite a stressful um situ uh, mental health situation so yeah and uh, um, uh yeah so high high integrity and high emotion intelligence are are required in in business regardless of whether you're selling or or, or running a business yes, absolutely yes important yes. ingredients yeah i mean that's not to say there are people who haven't built businesses without those skills but it just makes building business a lot easier if you have those skills really so uh, yeah so very interesting alan we could talk for days on end but we don't have time now so how do people get hold of you uh well i'm on linkedin that's probably the easiest way of getting hold of me um uh, uh, uh i'll give you a link to the linkedin and if you put that in the chat box um all my contact details are on that so uh, i'm not so desperate uh we will have a website fairly soon i mean, Dominic and I are only just together in partnership with this getting thing going. So in due course, we'll have, we'll have a website. Um, uh, but um, uh, at the moment, the best way of getting hold of me is via LinkedIn. So uh, I think. OK, so, so for those listening on podcast, that's Alan Kennedy uh, on LinkedIn. Yeah. Marvellous. Thank you very much for your time today, Alan, and, and uh, taking us down some rabbit holes, of which there are many. <laughs> <laughs> OK, lovely. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you.